Well, good afternoon and welcome to the first in this year's series of Perspectives on Economic Liberty, which is hosted by the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at, Ari at Arizona State University. The Perspective series emerges from the Center's mission to evaluate the contribution um, of economic liberty to human betterment, as you see the advancing human betterment slogan. One of the re ways to do that is to bring a variety of guests in to interrogate our center's topic by revisiting past debates or um, considering its relationship to other human values and freedoms that we may hold. Um, and uh, we certainly are going to hear things related to that today. Um, Sarah Squire, oh, I should also say, um, in, before I introduce Sarah, that uh, this event has been co-sponsored by the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State and jointly sponsored with uh, New College here on the uh, West Campus. <clears throat> Sarah Squire is a senior fellow, fellow and web editor. I think my southern accent came out there with the feller. Uh, <laughs> senior fellow and web editor at Liberty Fund. Um, a nonprofit educational foundation. Um, in her web editing uh, capacity at Liberty Fund, for those of you, you familiar with it, she uh, manages now the Adam Smith Works uh, site and also the Library of Economic and Economics and Liberty, which is a site that I have frequently, frequently, frequently used uh, myself in uh, because of its access to texts which are available. Sarah is also the co-author of a college writing textbook called Writing with a Thesis, which is now in its 12th edition. Do you have a 13th out yet? No. Actually, I think you can't it's 13th. Okay, well that's wrong. There we go. Sarah graduated with honors in English from Wesleyan University and earned an MA and PhD in English from the University of Chicago. She's published on Shakespeare and on George Herbert, women in literature, bunch of other things too. She's also published articles in Literature and Medicine and the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. But she's also written about, the kids will wake up on this one, she's written about zombies, an essay called Eating Brains and Breaking Windows, <clears throat> the broken window fallacy for those of you who might have heard of that. She writes a regular column for the Freeman online and, a blog, and blogs for the Fraser Institute and Bleeding Heart Libertarians. I could go on, but I wanted to be sure to include this fun fact. In 39 days, as I count it, am I right? In 39 days, she will take her Taekwondo second degree black belt test. We wish her well. Sarah. So when I give talks, the first thing I always do is get to the room a little bit early so I make sure I can see over the podium, because um, sometimes I can't. Um, but here we're doing pretty well. Ross, you're just going to have to. I, you know what I look like, so. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today um, to talk a little bit about work um, and about why it matters how we talk about work. Um, one of the things I spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about these days and trying to persuade people of is that it matters a lot how we talk about things. And when I try and persuade people of this, I almost always start with a joke. And the joke I like to tell, to tell people why it's important how we say a thing, is a joke about two guys who are having an argument <clears throat> about whether it's okay to smoke and pray at the same time. Right? And so they decide to go visit the rabbi. Um, and the first guy goes in and he says, Rabbi, we're, we're having this argument. We need to know, is it OK <clears throat> to smoke when you're praying? And the rabbi says, absolutely not. Prayer is so important that you have to remain focused on it. And you mustn't let anything as quotidian and ordinary and day-to-day -day as smoking to take your focus away from the important task of prayer. And so he sighs and goes out of the rabbi's office and says to his friend, we can't, we can't smoke and pray at the same time anymore. Rabbi says, can't do it. The other guy says, let me ask him. Goes into the rabbi's office and he says, Rabbi, is it okay to pray 
when you're smoking. And the rabbi says, prayer is always appropriate. Right? It matters how you say something. It matters how you ask questions. It matters what you call things because that sets the frame for the answers that you're going to get. This is the most useful bit of advice you guys are going to get from this talk today. When you want something from your parents, ask them right and you might be able to get it. Ask them wrong and you're out of luck. So what I want to do today is talk about how we say things when we talk about work and talk about some of the kinds of things that we say when we talk about work. And the reason that I want to do this is because work, all kinds of work, um, at home, at the office, on farms, and in factories, all of the way up and down the pay scale, that work is the engine that drives the free market. And if we love free markets, if we love markets in a free society, and I do, and we love the liberty that is enabled by free exchange, voluntary free exchange between people, and I do, we have to be willing to, challenge, to, to tackle seriously the challenges of talking about all kinds of work. So the economist Deirdre McCluskey says that the way that we talk as a culture about things like work or about business or about money changes how we feel about them. She says, in fact, that the biggest push to bring us into the modern world from something that looked a lot more like the Middle Ages was a change in the way that we spoke and wrote about work and about business. That means that what we say when we talk about work matters. It matters if we think and say that working makes us <clears throat> a slave to the man or a cog in a machine. It matters if we think and say that work is degrading or that it's fulfilling or that it's creative or that it's deadening. It matters that I started this talk by calling work the engine that drives the free market. And I think that for quite some time now, we've been having a sort of long-term, large-scale crisis about work and about what work means. And what that means is that we have an opportunity, and a really important opportunity, to have a discussion about work that's clear-eyed about its problems, but also optimistic about its po possibilities. But before we get to that, I want to go back in history um, to take you through a very uh, brief and ridiculously superficial but profusely illustrated history of work in the Western world. So here we have the land of cocaine, which is a painting uh, by Peter Bruegel the Elder from 1567. Now in the Middle Ages, the land of cocaine was a fantasy world like Oz or Narnia or Hogwarts. Um, it's a fantasy land with perfect weather, with sexual license, and with an endless supply of roasted chickens. And I think you can see a couple of roasted chickens flying around in this, uh, in this painting. They fly around already cooked, ready to just sort of be grabbed out of the sky and put onto your plate. Um, and there's a roast pig um, down there um, who's already got a fork stuck in him for easier eating. Right? So you don't have to do anything. You just reach over and grab the pig and, and, and munch. Um, and pastries and pies were imagined to be so common in the land of cocaine that you can see them there in the upper corner of the painting. They're being used to thatch the roof of the building over there. Those are pies. Um, it's surplus. The whole, the land of cocaine is made up entirely of surplus. And this tasty, tasty surplus is fantastic, of course, right? But it's not the most important thing about the land of cocaine. The most important thing is what we learn from one of the many, many songs and poems written about it. And it goes like this. Of livelihoods there are plenty that men do in all of the lands for keeping body and soul together. Hear this. I came lately on a land, there it was strange and unknown. Now listen well, for it is wondrous true what God the people there has commanded in that land to live and be without work and without pain. Has anyone seen a better land than that land of cocaine? The most important thing about the land of cocaine, about the medieval fantasy, is that there isn't any work. 
It's like the American folk song, The Big Rock Candy Mountain, that some of you might know, where you sleep all day and they hung the jerk that invented work in the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Um, the work-free world is one of our great fantasies. From the land of cocaine to the Big Rock Candy Mountain to current books like Timothy Ferris's The Four-Hour Work Week, right? We all want to work less, or not at all, if we can get away with it. Now, while many of us tend to romanticize the Middle Ages into something like this, as a time of lords and ladies and knights and jousting, feasts and fools, the people who were actually living in the time longed for escape from their daily grind as much as we long to escape ours. And what did that daily grind look like? So daily life in the Middle Ages was overwhelmingly rural. Despite the increasing flourishing and growth of cities like London, over 90% of the medieval population still supported themselves and their family by laboring on the land. That this is the world that invented the work-free fantasy of the land of cocaine ought to suggest to us that a life spent working close to the soil in bucolic, uncommercialized, non-industrialized surroundings may possibly have a few disadvantages, like back-breaking physical labor, subjection to the unpredictable forces of nature, very little mobility of location, for individuals and families, and even less mobility of income, trade, and social status. Thomas Hardy, writing much, much later in the 1860s, paints a grim picture of this kind of rural life in his novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. These are people uh, gleaning wheat in the field, an occupation that is, goes back at least as far as the Bible. Those of you who know your book of Ruth, uh, Ruth gleans wheat from the corners of the fields. Right? These are folks in, painted in 1857 doing the same job. Um, and here we have Thomas Hardy describing something very similar. Um, he writes, they worked on hour after hour, unconscious of the forlorn aspect they bore in the landscape, not thinking of the justice or injustice of their lot. Even in such a position as theirs, it was possible to exist in a dream. In the afternoon, the rain came on again, and Marion said they need not work anymore. But if they did not work, they would not be paid. So they worked on. It was so high a situation in this field that the rain had no occasion to fall, but raced along horizontally upon the yelling wind, sticking into them like glass splinters until they were wet through. Tess had not known till now what was really meant by that. There are degrees of dampness. Um, but to stand working slowly in a field and feel the creep of rainwater, first in legs and shoulders, then on hips and head, then at back, front, and sides, and yet work on till the leaden light diminishes and marks that the sun is down, demands a strict modicum of stoicism, even of valor. It's these disadvantages of rural labor, coupled with the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, that began to spur the consistent movement of people from rural areas into urban areas, into labor in the city. Now, how fast did that move happen? It started very slowly at first, as the Middle Ages gave way to the early modern world, and uh, literal mobility and income mobility began to increase. Then the change came roaring on, until by the first years of the 20th century, you have roughly 40% of the population in agriculture and 60% in the city. Remember, it was 90% of people working in agriculture back when they're dreaming of the land of cocaine. Theodore Dreiser's great novel, Sister Carrie, which was published in 1900, tells the story of one of these workers who moves from the rural world of farm work into the big city. Carrie Mieber, who is destined to live large, sin big, and climb to the top while watching and helping other people destroy themselves, comes from a middle of nowhere village called Columbia City into the boom town of Chicago. And this is what Chicago looked like in 1900 when Carrie moved to the big city from her farm town. Dreiser describes Carrie's first reaction to Chicago this way, to the child, to the genius with imagination or the wholly untraveled, the approach to a great city for the first time 
is a wonderful thing, particularly if it is evening, that mystic period between the glare and gloom of the world when life is changing from one sphere of condition to the other. Ah, the promise of the night. What does it not hold for the weary? What old illusion of hope is not here forever repeated? Says the soul of the toiler to itself, I shall soon be free. I shall be in the ways and the hosts of the merry. The streets, the lamps, the lighted chamber set for dining are for me. The theaters, the halls, the parties, the ways of rest and the paths of song, these are mine. For Carrie, as for the thousands of people pouring into these new cities, these growing cities every year, the city was the place of dreams, of hopes, of limitless potential. It was the place where you could just escape that kind of work described by Thomas, Thomas Hardy, that back-breaking labor out in the elements, gleaning in the fields, picking produce. And you could exchange it um, uh, for urban work. It was the place where, as Adam Smith writes, one could have a much wider range and draw their subsistence from the most remote corners of the world, either in exchange for the manufactured produce of their own industry or by performing the office of carriers between distant countries and exchanging the produce of one for that of another. A city might in this manner grow up to great wealth and splendor, while not only the country and its neighborhood, but all those to which, it tra to which is traded were in poverty and wretchedness. The city became the place of growth and of potential and of innovation and of creative drive. That is, of course, not all that the city means. The more that industrialization progressed and the faster the Industrial Revolution grew, the louder were the protests raised against it. Now, I want to be very, very careful here. I am an enormous fan of technological progress. I like industry. I like inventions, innovation, entrepreneurship, advancements, and capitalism. But the Industrial Revolution was not without its very human and very real costs. And so those of us who do like industry and inventions and entrepreneurship and advancements and capitalism don't do ourselves any favors if we aren't honest about those costs. Something, after all, was inspiring people like William Blake to write poems about England's dark satanic mills. Something inspired protest lyrics like this one from 1836. Isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die. Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave, for I'm so fond of liberty, I can never be a slave. And the hazards of mill work were fairly minimal in comparison to those of factory work. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911 caused the deaths of 146 garment workers mostly immigrant w women and children of about the age of the kids over here um, working in a garment factory in New York City because the managers had locked the doors to the stairways and the exits in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Now this was a common practice used to control workers' behavior, made sure they only took bathroom breaks and lunch breaks when they were supposed to take them. But because the managers had locked the doors, many of the workers who could not escape the burning building through the stairways jumped from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors to the streets below and died from the fall. Others never got out at all and died from the flames and from smoke inhalation. To pretend that this didn't happen is to do a disservice to what markets bring us. Now, at around the time of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, back in England, Maud Pember Reeves published her great book, Round About a Pound a Week, which is an early demographic study. And for the economists in the room, you should drop everything, write down the name of this book, and go read it, because it is astonishing. Um, it's an early demographic study of a working poor neighborhood in London, where respectable poor families, the wives and children of men typically employed as um, laborers, or a mate, or a handyman, respectable men in uh, in full work at more or less the top wage for the time, um, where families like these were living on just about a pound per week for all of their expenses. What Pember Reeves's book is so great about is that it gives us a sense of what 
life looks like in the city for someone with that kind of work. And here's what she says. How does a working man's wife bring up a family on 20 shillings a week? Assuming that there are four children and that it costs four shilling a week to feed a child, there would be only four shillings left on which to feed both parents and nothing at all left for coal, gas, clothes, insurance, soap, or rent. Four shillings is the amount allowed for the foster mother for food in the case of a child who's boarded out by the Board of Guardians. Therefore, it seems like a justifiable figure to reckon on. But for a woman with 20 shillings a week to spend, it's evidently ridiculously high. If the calculation were to be made among, upon half this sum, would it be possible? The food for the children in that case could amount to eight shillings. To allow the same amount to each parent as to each child would not be an extravagance. And on this basis, we arrive at the sum of 12 shillings per week for six people. That leaves eight shillings for all other expenses. But rent alone comes to six or seven shillings. And how could the woman on 20 shillings a week manage with one or perhaps two shillings for coal, gas, insurance, clothes, cleaning materials, and thrift? The usual answer to, this question, to a question of this kind is that the poor are very extravagant. It does not answer. It does not fit the question. Reeves's great discovery from her demographic study is not that the poor are extravagant, which was the argument currently made, made in those days. Um, her answer is the poor are poor because they don't make very much money. As roundabout a pound a week continues, Pember Reeves shows us precisely what a grim calculus these families have to engage in. Despite hard work and careful thrift, the money just isn't there. And families are left deciding whether the father, who brings home the life-saving wage envelope, or the vulnerable children should eat on a given day. They decide which of the children should be allowed to wear the one decent pair of shoes and go to school. They decide whether to buy coal to heat their rooms or medicine for a sick child. There are no easy choices in this world. Capitalism, its early stages, the Industrial Revolution were not always pretty. They were just better overall than rural life was for most people. And the history of people voting with their feet and moving from rural occupations in the farm to factory occupations in the city shows that people were willing to accept those hazards and costs for the promise of a better life, even at a pound a week. So that life we just described, where you're deciding which kid gets to wear the pair of shoes and whether you can feed the children or feed dad who has to go to work in the morning. That life was enough better than the standard run of rural work that people still chose it. They came in droves to choose it. And we can say that by our lights, by our modern lights, both versions of work are reprehensible and oppressive and awful. And we don't want anybody to have to have either of those kinds of occupations, but we can say, in the time, one was clearly better. And if you're trying to persuade a friend about the joys of capitalism, or if you're arguing for right-to-work legislation, like we have in Indiana, or if you're wondering why your dad thinks unions are great ideas, you have to remember those pictures of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And you have to remember the choices made by the families that Maud Pember Reeves studied, because that's what people who argue against free markets and who argue against capitalism are thinking of. Those are the pictures that they have in their heads. Uh, Several years ago, we had a surge of reports of factory fires and collapses in Bangladesh um, and in China and elsewhere. So before we, for example, start talking about how great sweatshop jobs are um, for getting people out of uh, poverty, we have to remember that when we say sweatshops, they see the Rana Plaza factory fire and collapse, and they see triangle shirtwaist. We need to know that these are the images in people's minds and we need to counter them. We need to make intelligent, aware, and sensitive arguments that acknowledge that free markets 
are not always a fairy tale. They don't solve anything. We have to calibrate our own rhetoric. So the backlash against industrialization, industrialization spurred by things like triangle shirtwaist, spurred in the 21st century by things like the Rana Plaza factory fire, um, brought about a literary and artistic response that takes us back to the land of cocaine for a minute. You remember the land of cocaine, right? That's where we started. Um, the 15th to 18th century version of the medieval stories of cocaine are called pastorals. Now a pastoral is a school of art and of literature that gives us paintings like these. Aren't they sweet? I don't think they're getting a lot of work done. Has anybody lived on a farm? Any, does anybody grow up in rural? Yeah, is this a good way to take care of your cows? Not, yeah, not, not so much. <laughs> um, um, the pastoral also gives us a series of poems about country estates that are so magically well supplied um, that neither from nor to the, thy store winter takes aught or spring adds more. And poems like Spencer's Shepherd's Calendar, which is pretty much a poetic version of Marie Antoinette's play farm that she stocked with beribboned and perfumed sheep. Uh, the 19th century resuscitates this sort of uh, literary work uh, with poems like Matthew Arnold's Thrissus which equates a longing for vanishing rural life and pleasures with the loss of a beloved friend. He says, too rare, too rare, grow now my visits here. But once I knew each field, each flower, each stick, and with the country folk acquaintance made, by barn in threshing time, by new built rick, here too our shepherd pipes we first essayed. Ah me, this many a year my pipe is lost, my shepherd's holiday. Needs must I lose them, needs with heavy heart, into the world and wave of men depart. But Thrissus of his own will went away. He loved each simple joy the country brings. He loved his mates, but yet he would not keep, for that shadow lowered on the fields, here with the shepherds and the silly sheep. And it's right about here, with Matthew Arnold and his silly sheep, that things get really interesting for those of us who want to think about the ways that we think about work and the ways that we talk about work. Because the 19th century, in addition to being the age of industrialization, was also the age of the novel. And this means that all of a sudden, writers had these giant artistic canvases upon which to explore their thoughts about work. And it is these giant canvases to which people most often refer when they want to prove that literature, about which I care a lot, hates capitalism, entrepreneurship, inventions, industry, advancements, about which I also care a lot. They want to argue that literature is, in, ens in essence, anti-work. Now, again, in the interest of not telling you any pretty little lies or you know, be ribboning any sheep up here, um, I will confess that there's a certain amount of truth to this point of view. Most famously, perhaps, Charles Dickens' great novel, Hard Times, describes the industrial city of Coketown, which was his fictional analog to the 19th century city of Manchester, pictured here, and you'll notice all the black smoke billowing out of the um, smokestacks there. Um, he describes uh, Coketown thus. It lay shrouded in a haze of its own, which appeared impervious to the sun's rays. You only knew the town was there because you knew there could have been no such sulky blotch upon the prospect without a town. A blur of soot and smoke, now going this way, now that way, now aspiring to the vault of heaven, now creeping along the earth. As the wind rose or fell, a dense formless jumble with sheets of cross light in it that showed nothing but masses of darkness. The wonder was that it was there at all. It had been ruined so often that it was amazing how it had borne so many shocks. Surely there was never such fragile chinaware as, which, as that of which the millers of Coketown were made. Handle them never so lightly, and they fell to pieces with such ease that you might suspect them of having been flawed before. They were ruined when they were required to send laboring children to school. They were ruined when, they, uh, when inspectors were appointed to look into their works. They were ruined when the inspectors considered it doubtful whether they were entirely justified in chopping people up with their machinery. They were utterly undone when it was hinted that perhaps they need not always make quite so much smoke. Dickens is pretty vicious here. 
about the hideousness of Coketown, the callousness of mill owners who chop up people with their machinery and who willfully and stubbornly insist upon their right to coat all of Coketown in smoke, dust, and smog. Now, you start adding in a few other 19th century novels, like Disraeli's Sybil, which is about the perils of trying to unionize, and Frank Norris's McTeague, during which a host of British city dwellers are driven mad and made even more animalistic by their desire for wealth, and talk in, toss in the work of muckraking journalists like Upton Sinclair and Ida Tarbell, who exposed all kinds of corporate chicanery, and one does begin to see why city work rapidly became devalued in much of the literature of the period. Then, you add in the stories of hardy pioneers on the plains, as masterfully rendered by writers like Willa Cather, and you start to see why those who haven't read more deeply think that the devaluation of urban work and of industrialization is the whole picture from the 19th century. But they're forgetting about writers like Elizabeth Gaskell. Gaskell's novel, The North and the South, is one of my favorite for talking about complex representations of business and economic issues in literature. Generally, it's remembered for being her Manchester novel, focusing on manufacturing and labor debates in Manchester, and serving as a response to Dickens' picture of Coketown in Hard Times. And I have to take a second here, because a lot of people sort of read Hard Times and read um, Christmas Carol and think that Charles Dickens is a very anti-business kind of a guy, and indeed there's plenty of moments like that. But it's important to remember that uh, Gaskell's The North and the South was published in the magazine, Household Words, that Dickens edited. So he chose to publish it, and he published it concurrently with his novel, Hard Times. So you'd read a chapter of Hard Times, turn the page, and there'd be a chapter of Gaskell's North and South. Right, so he was publishing the debate over industrialization, and I think he doesn't get enough credit for that. That's my parenthetical defense of Dickens for the moment. What we forget about Gaskell um, as well is that her exceptionally clear-eyed approach to the hazards and the benefits of living in Victorian era Manchester was not accompanied by a pastoral inflected romanticization of the countryside. In other words, she doesn't critique industrialization by praising the countryside. She doesn't build a fictional land of cocaine as an as an um, antithesis to her portrait of the problems of factory work. Um, there are no silly sheep in Gaskell's novel. There are no nymphs and shepherds dallying in the glades, and there are no blissful factory workers either. When one of her novel's characters says he's had it with factory work, and that he plans to head down south to go back and work on the farms, he's told in no uncertain terms, you must not go to the south. You would have to be out in all weathers, and it would kill you with rheumatism. The mere bodily work at your time of life would break you down. You couldn't bear the dullness of the life. You don't know what it is. It would eat you away like rust. Those that have lived there all their lives are used to soaking in those stagnant waters. They labor on from day to day in the great solitude of steaming fields, never speaking or lifting up their poor, bent, downcast heads. The hard spade work robs their brain of life. The sameness of their toil deadens their imagination. They don't care to meet to th talk over thoughts and speculations. After work is done, they go home tired, caring for nothing but food and rest. You could not stir them up into any companionship when you get, which you get in a town as plentifully as the air you can breathe. And I don't know I don't know, but that you of all men are not one to bear a life among such laborers. What would be peace to them would be eternal fretting to you. Gaskell's point is similar to mine. Factory work was hard work. It was dangerous work. It was dull. It could be backbreaking. But there were reasons that people rushed from the country to fill the jobs at the factories and at the mills. And there are reasons that today, only about 2% of workers are in agricultural occupations. Now, Adam Smith, by the way, knew that this was going to happen. He wrote in The Wealth of Nations that hunting and fishing, which are the most important employments of mankind in the rude state of society, become in its advanced state their most agreeable amusements, and they pursue from, for pleasure what they once followed from necessity. 
In the advanced state of society, therefore, they are all very poor people who follow as a trade what other people pursue as a pastime. As society becomes more complex and the division of labor becomes more precise and sophisticated, the old survival skills like hunting and fishing, fishing and gardening and raising chickens in the backyard, um, those become increasingly often hobbies that rich people engage in on the weekends. I can food for fun. That's not why my great-grandmother canned food. Um, I knit for fun. That's not why my great-grandmother knit. That change, right, that change of work from work we used to do to have to survive to work that we now do because it's fun to can or raise chickens or knit or whatever makes it easier for us to romanticize those former occupations and forget that when you're engaged in that work for mortal stakes, they aren't so retrofabulous. They're not so much fun. Maybe when these guys grow up or maybe when these guys have kids of their own, those kids will wax nostalgic over cubicle culture. But who am I kidding? We're already making TV shows like Mad Men and Pan Am about the good old days in golden age industries like advertising and aviation. So that's our, now that I look at it, not really all that brief history of work. But where does it leave us? We can't valorize rural agricultural work, no matter how much we might appreciate a good uh, local tomato or a crop of fresh sweet corn, because we've learned too much from Elizabeth Gaskell and Thomas Hardy to have any faith in a romanticized version of rural life. We can't valorize factory work, no matter how enthusiastic we are about the awesome growth of technology and the productivity that re resulted from it, because it's a little hard to stop thinking about those slides I showed you of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire and the Bhopal disaster. And we can't stop thinking about those numbers from around about a pound a week. So are we stuck? Is work, is all work really just some kind of divine punishment? I'm about, am I about to tell you guys that you better just pack it in, find the land of cocaine, and hope that a roast chicken flies by? I am not. If I were going to, I don't think Ross would have had me in. <laughs> what, I, what I am going to say is that I think that we owe ourselves and each other and the world of work that is the engine of the free market, we owe it all a new way to think about work and to value it for what it is, rather than for what we wish it might be. As Steve over there might be liable to say, we shouldn't let our desires for what work ought to be like override what work actually can be like. Matthew Crawford's book, Shop class as soul craft can be a little problematic insofar as I don't think it really gets capitalism and markets. But the book is exceptionally good on breaking through the pieties and idiocies that come up whenever we start to talk about work. A job stocking shelves at Best Buy, Crawford points out, is an $8 or more by now uh, job stocking shelves at Best Buy. And while one might be very delighted to have a job, it is not despite what the company's mission statement would say, a job that is designed to unleash the power of all our people as they have fun while being the best. Pretending that we can make shelf stocking creative and interesting just by putting it in our mission statement is getting caught up in the kind of oughts that I'm warning you about, getting caught up in a fantasizing vision of what work could look like. Instead, what Crawford says is that we have to think about the basic truth of the situation. Work is toilsome, and it necessarily serves someone else's interests. That's why you get paid. Thus chastened, we may ask the proper question. What is it that we really want for a young person when we give him or her vocational advice? The only creditable answer, it seems to me, is one that avoids utopianism, that avoids the land of cocaine, while keeping an eye on the human good keeping an eye on work that engages the human capacities as fully as possible. What I like about Crawford's book is this insistence that the work that engages the human capacity as fully as possible doesn't need to be any particular specific kind of work. It merely needs to be the kind of work that is best suited to the individual person who's doing the work. The work that allows each person to engage his or her individual capacities. 
Crawford has a PhD in philosophy, spent a lot of time working at think tanks and at the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought. Now he runs a motorcycle repair shop because for him, the work of fixing motorcycles is more meaningful and more fully engaging of his capacities than academic work. Now, the philosopher Lauren Lamasky tells us that people are pursuers of projects. That we really are deep down. We like to do stuff. More than that, Lamasky tells us that it is a good and a moral thing to be a pursuer of projects because since we value our projects, it confirms for us that we have worth and value because we do stuff that we think has worth and has value. And it confirms for us by extension that other people who pursue their own projects have worth and value as well. Now, I want us to find a way to talk about work that allows us to bring in Lamasky's respect for the projects of others, as well as respect for our own kinds of projects. The working world is full of people exploring and engaging and developing their capacities in all kinds of ways. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Stugs Turkle interviewed a sampling of them in his book titled Working, which is a series of interviews with people about their jobs. Now, the book is full of surprises for those of us who might be inclined to think that salary and prestige are what it takes to create satisfying work. Most of us, for example, would probably assume that working on an assembly line is boring. Wheeler Stanley, and here's a picture of a Diego Rivera uh, mural um, of assembly line work. Um, Wheeler Stanley, who worked on an auto assembly line before being promoted to be the foreman of the line, begs to differ. He says about assembly line work, I could look at a job and I could do it. My mind would just click. I would stand back, take a look at a job, and I could do it. My mind would just click on it. I enjoyed the work. I felt it was a man's job. You can do something with your hands. It was far from boring. There was a couple of us that we were hired together. We'd come up with different games, like we'd take the numbers of the Jeeps that went by. The guy who loses buys the coffee. Then there's Babe Sicoli, a grocery store checkout clerk, whose pride and satisfaction in the, her expertise at her job shines through. There are items I never heard of that we sell here. I know the prices of everyone. Sometimes the boss asks me, and I get a kick out of it. On the register, there's a list of some prices. That's for the part-time girls. I never look at it. I don't have to look at the keys on my register. My hand fits. Then there's Elmer Ruiz reminding us, not anybody can be a grave digger. You can dig a hole any way they come. A grave digger, you have to make a neat job. I had a fellow once. He wanted to see a grave. He was a fellow that digged sewers. He was impressed when he see me dig in this grave, how square and how perfect it was. A human body is going into this grave. That's why you need skill. Now these workers, talking about jobs that many would classify as menial or blue collar or plain old awful, talk about expertise and about creativity and about pride so here's my first rule for the way I'd like to see us change the way we talk about work. I'd like to see us start to acknowledge that instead of being some kind of paid slavery, work, any kind of work, can give us pride and pleasure. Mike Rowe's TV show sadly ended now, but one of my favorites when it was on, uh, Dirty Jobs, took a long look at a lot of jobs that most of us would think no one would want. He took us inside jobs that most of us can't imagine having and shows us not only the stinky, slimy, revolting parts of the work, but also the ways in which human capacities flourish even there. Now, I was reviewing my talk before I came over to ASU, and this is ordinarily the part of this talk where I'd pause and I'd show a five-minute clip of, of Mike Rowe, but this is a lunch talk, and the clip is Mike Rowe discussing lamb castration. So I decided I'd just summarize for you guys. <laughs> um, but if you're interested, Mike Rowe's TED talk on lamb castration is spectacular. I will summarize here, quote briefly later. Um, if I had run the clip, <laughs> you would learn a little bit about the time that Mike Rowe learned how to castrate sheep. Um, 
the show Dirty Jobs was going to do an episode on the topic, so Roe called the Humane Society to learn how to do the job humanely. Um, then he went to visit the shepherd who did the job every day. The shepherd did it entirely differently. Mike was horrified. He said, I want to do it the right way. I want to do it the way that the guys say at the Humane Society that you got to do it. The shepherd said, okay. Um, and they demonstrated the humane way to uh, follow this procedure on sheep. It was immediately clear to Roe that the lamb suffered much more um, and for longer um, and with more, uh, more deleterious side effects, shall we say, than when done the more efficient way, the more traditional way by the shepherd. Mike Rowe talks about this moment in his career as the moment when he realized that his show wasn't just some kind of comic excursion into really gross jobs, which it also is, but it wasn't just that. It's doing something more important, more interesting and more significant. And that's what I find so striking about this story. Um, it's the conflict between what Roe was told about lamb castration and what he actually experienced. The Humane Society told Roe that their way of castrating the sheep was better for the animal and the right way. The sheep rancher had an entirely different method. And who to thunk it, the guy who actually castrates hundreds of lambs as part of his job knows more about the best way to get the job done. The method that looks more horrifying is kinder to the animal than the method that the animal lovers recommend. And that's our second rule. The only expert is the person who does the job. Okay? Don't stand around the construction site and tell a bunch of guys how to dig a hole if you've never lifted a shovel. Listen to the voices and trust the knowledge of the people who actually do the work. You will learn an awful lot that way. Now, speaking of dirty jobs, I did not put this stuff in just for you guys, but this is all the poop jokes in my talk, so you're going to want to pay attention. They all sat up. That was awesome. You're going to want to pay attention to this part. If you, when your parents want to know what you learned today, tell them this part. Um, so the fictional character with the dirtiest job that I can think of is Harry King, who comes from Terry Pratchett's series of Discworld novels. I don't know if any of you guys are Discworld fellow travelers, the wonderful science fiction fantasy series. Um, Harry King um, is a night soil man and crossing sweeper, and he appears at the greatest length in a novel called The Truth. This is a somewhat long excerpt, but I'm not even going to apologize because it's hilarious, and it's going to take us directly to the third and final rule. Harry was called the King of the Golden River. This was a recognition of his wealth and achievements and also the source of his success, which was not quite the classical river of gold. It was considered a advance on his former nickname, which was Piss Harry. Harry King had made his fortune by the careful application of the old adage, where there's muck, there's brass. There was money to be made out of, out of things that people threw away, especially the very human things that people threw away. The real foundations of his fortune came when he started leaving empty buckets at various hostelries around the city uh, center, especially those that were more than a gutter's length from the river. He charged a very modest fee to take them away when they were full. This is before there were toilets inside the house. That's what they're using the buckets for, guys. Harry King had learned something that can be the key to great riches. There is very little however disgusting, that isn't used somewhere in some industry. There are people out there who want large quantities of ammonia and saltpeter. If you can't sell it to the alchemists, then the farmers probably want it. If the farmers don't want it, then there is nothing, nothing however gross, that you can't sell to the leather tanners. Harry felt like the only man in a mining camp who knows what gold looks like. He started taking on whole streets at a time and branched out. In the well-to-do areas, the householders paid him. They paid him to take away night soil, the by now established buckets, the horse manure, the dustbin, and even the dog muck. Did they have any idea how much the leather tanners paid for the finest dog muck? It was like being paid to take away squishy diamonds. Harry couldn't help it. The world fell over itself to give him money. 
Someone somewhere would pay him for a dead horse or two tons of shrimp so far beyond their best date that it couldn't be seen with a telescope. And the most wonderful part of it all was that someone had already paid him to take it away. If anything absolutely failed to find a buyer, there were his compost heaps downstream of the city, where the volcanic heat of decomposition made fertile soil out of everything that was left. He'd kept the wood pulp and rags business closer to home, though, along with the huge vats that contained the golden foundations of his fortune, because it was the only part of his business that his wife would talk about it. Rumor had it that she had also been behind the removal of the much admired sign over entrance to his yard, which said, Harry King taking the piss since 1961. Now it read, Harry King recycling nature's bounty. So what rule exactly does Harry's story give us, aside than if you're giving a talk with a bunch of elementary school kids in the audience, you should always tell a poop joke. Um, the rule is work is not static. Harry began on the lowest rung of society as a night soil collector, and guys, this was a real job, right? It still is a real job in parts of the world where there's not indoor plumbing in a lot of places. There are people who come around every morning and take the buckets away from the houses. Great job, right? Awesome. Um, but with initiative and with entrepreneurship and with an eye for opportunity, Harry King became one of the richest men in the city with a network of businesses and employees that reached nearly everywhere. Looking at data about who does what kind of work is like looking at any other kind of economic data. You're getting a snapshot, not a moving picture. And because these are people's lives and careers we are talking about, this is data that's in motion over the course of a lifetime and over the course of generations. It's okay to spend a life in a job that no one else likes or understands if that's what you want to do. My great grandfather was a peddler with a horse and cart on the streets of New York until the 1950s, for heaven's sakes. He liked the horse, he liked the people, he liked to be outside. But you don't have to stay where you are. And the people whose work we talk about and whose work we study don't have to stay in their jobs either, and they probably won't not in the hurly-burly that is today's working world. They'll work at one thing for a while, and then they'll move on and up and out. So when we talk about factory workers, or when we talk about farm workers, or about cubicle dwellers, as if they're some sort of permanent fixed class, as if they're somehow serfs that are tied to that particular place and that particular occupation, um, what we're doing then is to say that our work is all that we are, and that we're doomed to do the same thing to do and to be the same thing forever. In a world like today, where there's so many different kinds of work to do, so many different things you can try, that's simply not likely. So those very tentatively are my rules. Work, any kind of work, can give us pride and pleasure. The only expert is the one who does the work, and work is not static. And I think if we can start a conversation about work that begins with these rules or guidelines or observations in place, we might be able to find a way to keep ourselves from wasting our lives lying around and dreaming about pies on the roof and roast chickens falling from the sky in the land of cocaine, or engaging in endless wrangling over whether farm work or factory work is more oppressive, or trying to find ways to pretend that stocking shelves or flipping burgers is the key part of an employer's mission statement. Mike Rowe says it like this. We've declared war on work as a society, all of us. It's a civil war. It's a cold war, really. We didn't set out to do it, and we didn't twist our mustache in some Machiavelli Machiavellian way, but we've done it. Me, I'd like us to end that war to stop the endless cycle between dreaming of the land of cocaine and excoriating the factory. I'd like us to be able to have real conversations about what makes work valuable and meaningful. We all need to do it, whether we're in an ivory tower or white, pink, or blue collar job, so we'd better be able to talk about it, and we better know that when we do talk about work, it matters what we say, and it matters how we say it. Thank you very much. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Great job. I really enjoyed that. Um, as somebody who does what some people consider, you know, um, 
less worthwhile work, you know, with my, well, I guess in every field I work in probably. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have, a, I have a, a shipping business and I, I don't have a question exactly. I'm hoping you can help mm -hmm. me tease out an observation or a question. So I'm thinking along these lines about like Adam Smith and his expressed concerns about, uh, you know, these kind of menial tasks and the problems that it can, can be for, for a person. But I find great relief in sorting the mail. Now, you know, I've got banks of, of mailboxes mm -hmm. and I, I can spend an hour some days sorting, filling a uh, variety of mailboxes. But it gives me a chance to work through other problems and to, or just to give a break to uh, the, uh, the thinking of other creative endeavors and things like that. You know, a, a lot of times that kind of work is expressed as mind numbing, um, and that's supposed to be inherently negative. Right. Um, so, like, like I said, I don't quite have a question out of this, but uh, but I guess uh, I'm wondering is is there uh, am I crazy or is there a kind of a, is there a defense for this kind of work? Maybe if, as long as it's not the totality of your being, yeah. but as part of your life, this could be a very healthy thing. I'm also kind of thinking of Wallace Stevens, right, who was a poet and still stayed an accountant his whole yeah. life. You know, he, yeah. he maybe you know maybe it wasn't just mind numbing crunching of numbers, but that's usually a part of an accountant's job. Um, and he did not want to quit. I mean, he could have stopped being an accountant, and he chose not to. Yeah, he's one of the rare people who could have actually made a living as a poet, but yeah. chose instead to keep working for the insurance ag agency where, where he worked. Um, I, it's, I keep meaning to tell you about this, and so I'm really glad that you asked this question today because I I've, have a mental post-it note that I can now take off the, the wall of my brain. Um, there is, so in, in Ghana, um, people sing a lot of songs while they work. And there is a great work song from Ghana, from the post office in Ghana, where the postal workers have coordinated their work song with the stamping noise as they stamp the mail, as it goes through, and it is absolutely wonderful. And that might be a piece of art that is in itself a defense of the non-tedium of that kind of work, or maybe a defense of the our insistence on finding meaning and on making meaning and on making beauty out of jobs even, that, out of jobs that other people can't imagine, right? And this is why I think it's so imp important to listen to the voices in like Studs Terkel's work, right? Who would think that a guy who grives, uh, digs graves for a living, right, is thinking about it in the way that Elmer Ruiz, who, who I quoted in, in the talk, is thinking about it, right? We have to talk to people who do the jobs before we say, that's dehumanizing labor, right? That's a job that no person ought to have. Well, may, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe you ought to talk to the people who are doing the job, right? Your, your work, when you're sorting the mail, you're peaceful and meditative and, and released from things that are bothering you, probably stuff that people would think is more interesting um, and more important work, right? Um, I, we got to talk to the people doing the work, right? Sarah, thanks for keeping the poop jokes in there for my students. Oh, anytime. <coughs> I get a million. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to kind of question or, or add on to this mm -hmm. is with this kind of idea of a working vocabulary, how do you think this this can be applied to, I guess, kind of the, the modern trend, the more recent trend of everyone, or at least many young people in particular, having the primary job, but then also having their side hustle. Ah, yes. And, and the idea of the side hustle, where does that fit into this, this conversation? Well, the, the side hustle is interesting. Um, because I, when, when, when people who don't have a side hustle write about a side hustle. What you often hear is that this is a real tragedy, right? That we're no longer able to work just one job and support ourselves, and, and isn't it awful that all of the kids in their 20s have to have a side hustle? They gotta drive for Uber, or they gotta run a, you know, an online store, or they gotta, you know, whatever they're doing um, for their side hustle, and isn't it terrible 
that they have to do this, right? But again, when you talk to the people who are doing the side hustles, right? Sure, a lot of them are doing it to fill a necessity, right? They can't get enough hours or, or whatever. But for a lot of them, it also serves to fill a creative outlet or a social outlet, or they drive Uber often enough that it lets them put away more money for a cooler vacation or some real travel or some other goal that they want to meet. Um, or they have an Etsy store because they've always made, you know, crocheted cat figurines or something, and people keep telling them they should sell them, and they put them up on Etsy, and all of a sudden they're selling them, right? And so I think that people, um, <coughs> I think that the instinct of people who are like my age um, is to look at the side hustle and say, oh, that's, that's too bad that they have to do that to make ends meet. But when you talk to people with a side hustle, I think it's less of a problem. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's often a creative outlet and a good one. Sarah, thank you. This is lovely. So rich with all of the literary references and the art and just loved it. The only thing I missed were um, any references to historical religious texts and work, um, the Bible, the Quran, the Torah. Um, about how work is holy and we are called mm -hmm. to work. Can you speak to that? I don't have um, I don't have a ton on that. There certainly is a lot of good material on that. Um, I did bring up the the story of Ruth when we were talking about the the gleaners, which I think is important. Um, the parable of the talents. Um, from the, uh, the New Testament, which is not my half of the Bible, but you know, it's a good half, um, <laughs> um, is, is also useful. Um, Milton uh, has a great poem that s centers around the, the parable of the talents um, that talks about um, what work is and sort of deals with his blindness and whether the work that he's able to do because of his blindness um, is still holy work or not, whether he's really serving God that way. Um, I mean, religious, it, it's interesting because since work is part of the curse for being booted out of Eden, right, the way that we understand work religiously can be very complicated, right? You can look at it as a curse, right? You can look at it as an opportunity for, for, for Jews. We talk about the idea of tikkun olam, which is uh, the completion of the world. And the, the notion is that God created the world, but that, completion, that creation isn't complete without human action within that creation. Um, and that our actions help to, uh, help to forward that creation, help to bring it forward, right? So we don't wanna, one doesn't necessarily wanna stay in Eden or in a world that is just the way that God made it. One wants to add to it and, and complete it and do the things that humans were put here to do. Um, that's probably a much, much, much longer talk that I should write. <laughs> um, maybe. It's certainly a bigger subject um, than I have full time to answer. And of course, then you get to, you know, uh, Max Weber and the Protestant work ethic and the, you know, work for the night is coming. And, you know, we, we have to demonstrate our Christian virtue by demonstrating that we can live a life that is clean and that is pure and that is full of hard work turned into its proper channels, right? So there's, there's so much on that topic. I think that if I had put it in the talk, we'd, we'd be here until tomorrow. Um, there were, I'm not taking questions from Horwitz. He's married to me. He can ask me what he wants later. Yeah. Your dress looks beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that, that was the extent of her question. <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks so much for the talk. I really appreciated it as well. Uh, so my wife and I are both economists, but we're also parents of three young boys, ranging in age from 10 to five. One thing I always wanna make sure I do when I read them bedtime stories is I pick material that helps accentuate some of these rules, the idea that work yeah. is not stack, and work is pleasurable. Uh, but it's sometimes difficult to find those types of works, uh, or at the very least, not try to put my own spin on them and see what's actually in the text, right? Uh, Mike Mulligan and the steam engine is a good example that I tend to use when I try to discuss the idea of creative destruction with them, for instance. Mm -hmm. Do you have any children's books that you can think of that would help us 
communicate with the younger generation about. Yeah, I mean, the, how long have you got? Well, oh. um, well I'll be so, seeing you tomorrow, so too. The, so, so. The, Thanks. To, the toothpaste millionaire, toothpaste millionaire, um, write them down, toothpaste millionaire, uh, the push cart wars, um, both of which are by the same author whose name is currently escaping me, but they're fantastic. Push cart wars is basically um, public choice for kids, um, written by a non-economist who I doubt knew anything about public choice. Toothpaste Millionaire is about a boy who sets out to become a millionaire making toothpaste. Um, there's a Lawn Boy, I think it's the name of it, which is about a, a young man who starts a, a lawnmower business, a lawn mowing business, which is great. Um, I like, um, for, for linguistic entrepreneurship, there's a great book called Frindle. Do you guys know Frindle? best book ever. I love it. It's about a kid who decides that ballpoint pens should no longer be called ballpoint pens, but should be called frindles, um, and causes a little trouble at his school thereby. Um, strongly recommended, especially if you want to raise, raise him rebellious, which you should. Um, those, are, those are four or five, and they're, they're, they're all good for that age group. Um, other stuff, the, you know, the, the uh, turn of the century American stuff is almost always great on this. So Louisa May Alcott's book, Little Men, which is about the women from Little Women all grown up, and Joe is now running a boys' school, and it's about the, the boys in that school learning to, to be responsible young men. There's a lot of stuff there about work um, and about, about careers and what it means to be, to be a working person. Uh, no problem. That's my favorite kind of question. Well, let's uh, thank Sarah for her talk and uh, appreciate your- Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure.